two launch verses this morning, everyone. The first one is in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and we're also going to be looking at uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. We want to just encourage you with our memory verse this week, which is going to be Psalm 90, verse 2. And we're talking about the self-existence of God. God has always existed. He has always been. And we've got our verse, which is, Before the mountains were born, when you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You weren't God at one point in time and then you are you weren't created at one point in time you simply are and always have been from everlasting to everlasting yes. God yes. Wonderful. Genesis 1.1 1, 1, in the beginning God yes. God has always been yes. he currently is and always will be praise to his wonderful name that's why we have eternal life friends because yes. we have an eternal hope if God wasn't eternal we have no eternal hope yeah. there's good news in the gospel Amen. and so <clears throat> what we want to do this morning is look at our key texts before we dive into the uh, self-existence of God John chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning was the word the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is in the beginning. Those of you doing our study in First John know that there are three different beginnings in Scripture. This is the beginning uh, of all beginnings, Christ's pre-existence. So before He became flesh or became the living Word, uh, He was pre-existent, eternal. The same was with... The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So the self-existent God made all things. He who has always been made everything it has come into being. All things were made by him. Now let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Verses 16 and 17. This is building on the self-existence of God. God has always been. Colossians is just a monster book for some verses. We can play. We're just going to look at the two verses that are in chapter 1 of 16 and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, right? visible and invisible. Paul's just covering everything. Okay, if you're wondering whether it's just some things that God's created, God's created all things, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him. And I want you to notice this. All things were created, everyone, for him. By him and for him. For his glory. For his name's sake, as Rebecca has read this morning. All things were created not only by him, but for him. Well, as we've discovered through studying the knowledge and the attributes and the person of who God is, we recognise that our Christian world should change. In our modern day Christianity, our Christian world is all about us, what God's doing for me, what God is working in my life. What, what I'm doing is simply a thing for God because I get back from God and we've got the cart way before the horse. What we need to recognise here is as we study the attributes of God is that our life is centred around God and who He is and bringing glory to His wonderful name. Can I get yes. an amen out there this morning? We've recognised that our belief about God determines our decisions, our values, our ethics. Our understanding of who God is determines our decisions and the logic based behind that. Every decision you make has logic put into it. I understand and think this way, therefore I do certain things. And we need to go back to 
uh, logical outworking of who God is, therefore it will help us in our ethical and decision-making um, in life, our worldview, if you like. It determines how we act, pray, and of course there is no higher pursuit, there is no greater pursuit than the knowledge of who God is, than an understanding of who God is. It stands to reason that if we were created in God's image and made according to his likeness, we must understand God to understand ourselves. Is everyone getting that? Yes. You've got to understand who God is to actually understand who you are. We're made in his image and his likeness. And once we understand and see him for who he is, we begin to see who we are. This is why the book of James says, when we understand the word of God and start to see who God is, it reflects back on who we are. Yeah. And we start to get that reflection and see who we are in ourselves. So I want to encourage you with that, that as we launch out into the attributes of God, specifically here, the, that God is self-existent, that we will begin to see more and more of not only who God is, but seeing us in the light of who God is. Amen? Yes. Fantastic. So what I want to do is take you on a little bit of a journey this morning because we're going to go to what I would call as a human being an uncomfortable place, all right? We've got to go to an uncomfortable place where we work through the fact that God is self-existent and we are not. Have you ever been around a child who asks this probing question? Kids are good at this. They're very innocent, aren't they? And they ask these questions, Daddy, Mummy, who made God? Come on, some of you parents that have been there before. Where does God come from? You know, it, it's normally a bit of a stage thing, isn't it? You know, where do the trees come from? Well, you know, God made those. And well, where does the earth and the rivers and all those different things come from? Where do the stars come from? And all of these things. And of course, it gets back to the ultimate question. Well, if God made all of those, I mean, Daddy, who, who made God? Now, this is a question we're really uncomfortable with because God has always existed. He always has been. He's eternal. Well, this is a good question, but one which is obviously not easy to explain to a child. The answer, of course, is that God did not need to be made because he has always been. Of course, one of our readings as a church has been A.W. Tozer's The Knowledge of the Holy. And Tozer goes here on this, and have a listen to what he says. The child, by his question, or her question, where did God come from, is unwittingly acknowledging his creaturehood, that he's actually a creation, and he's asking that natural question that we should do from creator to creature or creation. Already the concept of cause and source and origin is firmly fixed in the child's mind. Untainted by religion, false concepts or human pride. He knows, that's the child, that everything around him came from something other than himself. It's intrinsic. We know it. And he simply extends that concept upward to God. Naturally, by the way. The little philosopher, Tozer calls him, the little philosopher, is thinking in true creature idiom and allowing for his lack of basic information, yet his reasoning is correct. He must be told that God has no origin and he will find this an incredibly hard thing to grasp since it introduces a category that is wholly unfamiliar to him. It contradicts the bent toward origin seeking so deeply ingrained in all intelligent beings, a bent that impels them to probe ever backward and backward toward what is called an undiscovered beginning. Evolutionists like to call it a big bang. Scientific theory likes to call it we come from something. Of course, we know now through the Hubble telescope, and even Einstein was wrong when he looked through Hubble's telescope, that the universe is expanding at a rate of knots, for want of a better term. And if the universe is expanding, it means it has momentum. Anything that has momentum starts 
somewhere. There is a beginning cause. And even the universe declares the handiwork and the design of a creator. Well, today, we look at, and we've, we've discovered this with God. God gives us, because we are made in his image, both communicable attributes and incommunicable attributes. God communicates certain attributes to us. Can anyone think of attributes that God communicates to us in a way that we participate in them? His attribute of anyone? Love. His attribute of grace. His attribute of mercy and faith. These are things that we participate with in and through the fact that we have the Holy Spirit within us and we're awakened to who God is. But there are also incommunicable attributes and we're looking at one this morning. God is self-existent. We are not. We have an origin. All right? Brenji, you're sitting next to your mum this morning. You have an origin. And even before you're in your mother's womb, God knew you. God originated who you are. He knew you by name, Jeremiah says, before you were in your mother's womb. So God knew you before your mother knew you, before we knew you. Sorry to pick on you this morning, but at least I didn't say anything about your hair this morning, okay? By the way, it's improving. I don't know what you're doing to it, but it's getting there, okay? It's fantastic. I'm just kidding. So today we're looking at the attribute of God, which is his self-existent. Now, another fancy word, if you're taking notes, everyone, is God's aseity. All right, his aseity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. Aseity, or like God's immensity, it finishes with an I-T-Y. The word A comes from the Latin word from, and S-E means himself. God is from himself. He has always been he has always existed. God is who He is and He has not needed to draw or come from anything or anyone else. It literally means from Himself. So being from oneself, it means that He has no other source. God's self-existence or He is a seity. I want you to listen to this because these are some good definitions for what we would call the self-existence of God. Uh, the Dictionary of Apologetics says God's a seed or self-existence is the divine property of God being completely independent of everything from God himself. All right? So the divine property of being completely independent of everything distinct from God himself. Everything other than God depends on God. Did you get that? But God depends on nothing besides himself. So God didn't need you. I don't want to shock you or rock your world here or disappoint you, but God doesn't need you. He always has been. He is and He always will be. The great Puritan Thomas Watson says, What is God? Takes for granted that there is a God. The belief of God's existence is the foundation of all religious worship. The fact that God exists is the reason we actually worship and want to worship. Friends, you know that even those who aren't Christians in your world want to naturally gravitate to worship something. We know in the Old Testament, religions and nations worshipped gods. It is in us to worship. We will find something to worship, whether it's a different god, a sports hero, or a, a, a car collection, or, you know, whatever it may be. But we will find something to worship, even relationships. An unborn child is dependent on its mother for life, right? Absolutely. Animals are dependent on their surroundings for life. Trees and plants are dependent on the sun and the rain for life. This is the order of creation. Everything living is dependent on something else, but God is dependent and existent in himself. So I'm building this here. God, we would say, has no origin said novation. It is precisely this concept of no origin which distinguishes that which is God from whatever is not God. So if it has an origin, it is not God. To say a prophet is God, they have an origin. It's not. They're not God. Okay? Only God and God alone 
is without origin. Aside from God, we would then say, nothing is self-caused. Okay, so you can't cause something to originate out of nothing. Only God can do that. Only God is self-caused. Are you getting this? I'm going slow because it's a really important thing to build this foundation in you because ultimately without this, we don't have that firm kind of rigidity in our foundation of knowing who uh, our God is. So God does not depend on any source for his existence and exists independently of any cause. God is, and God is fully capable of existing in isolation should he so choose. So he could have been eternally as Father, Son and Spirit, coexistent, co-communal and completely at one with himself. He didn't need to create a world. He didn't need the creation. But within the next couple of weeks, when we look at God's self-existence and then go on to God's self-sufficiency, we will see why God created us, why we pray, why we worship, and how this connects in with his complete will, plan, and purpose for his creation. So God's self-existence is seen in the name by which he revealed himself. Can anyone remember the name by which he revealed, first revealed himself to Moses? When Moses said, Who shall I say to Pharaoh has sent me? Because he's not going to believe me. If I come in the name of Pharaoh, it's not going to work. So whose name do I come in? And the Lord graciously, I say graciously because you can't name somebody who can be described. God is indescribable. We've been singing it this morning. Yet God gave a name and the name were actually four Hebrew letters that we've termed in our English Bible I am that I am. They are four letters Y-W-H-W or what we've termed and drawn out to be Yahweh. Yahweh. And that breath is uh, indicative of who God is. He is a spirit. And we know one of the words for spirit is pneuma or ruach. God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. God, the self-existent one, brought into creation man with his life, with his body, with his coded DNA and everything. An ordered God created an ordered man and an ordered universe. And God said to Moses, Tell Pharaoh that I am has sent you. Not I was, or is, or will be, but and God is ever present, ever will be, is able to do all, is in all, through all, by all, consists through all things. He is sovereign over all. I am in general. This is why the religious people of the day got so frustrated with Jesus. Because Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. <coughs> Are you calling yourself God? The am, the ever-present, the ever-all-knowing I will be forever? Yeah. Jesus said at the tomb of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. Then it comes to the Father, but through me. That's a pretty exclusive gospel. Jesus and him alone. So either Jesus was right, well, raising himself from the dead is probably a pretty good sign that we're talking about somebody here that did live up to his claims. God's self-existence, there's no doubt about it, it's a mystery. It cannot be understood by our finite minds. We get that, don't we? I mean, to come up with where God comes from. But a truth that renews our mind, it should give us comfort, it should give us assurance, and it should, certainly should stabilise our faith is that God exists independently of all things and thus he will always be there for us. This is why he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He is not only eternal and self-existent, but that outworks in his relationship with us. It undergirds the fact that there will never be a time, believers hear me here, where God will cease to exist or not be faithful to who he says he is. Yeah. 
You know, he's not some old guy on the throne that something happened to you while he was looking the other way or the angels weren't paying attention. God knows all, he sees all. And of course, we understand that because of this, there will be no change in his mind, his will, or his predetermined counsel. Which is why we understand that God is in control of all things. What God would you believe in that isn't in control of all things? What God is that? That isn't all-powerful? That's not a God. That's something that man has made up to have a face of a God, to have the understanding of something we would try and worship. But only God, who knows beginning from end, Alpha from Omega, the English, uh, the Greek language, is the A and the Z, the beginning from the end, is able to be eternal, self-sufficient, self-sustaining, and ultimately providential. Well, let's turn to the book of Acts 17 and see how Paul describes this self-existent God to people who were worshipping other gods in Greek or pagan uh, worlds. And in this case, it was Athens on the... uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 23 through 25... Paul alludes to God's self-existence, explaining to the intellectually curious Athenians of verse uh, 17 here, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So they knew they'd come from a creator, that's why we naturally worship. What therefore you worship in ignorance, I will now proclaim to you. Verse 24, the God who made the world and all things in it. So God, uh, Paul is stating there that when nothing existed, the self-existent God created the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, uh, since he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with hands, there's nothing you can do to house this God we're talking about. Neither is he served by human hands. And so he needed anything. He's addressing the fact that false gods, false religions, anthropomorphize God or they are anthropos. They put God, uh, man features on God. God needs our help. God needs our support. He needs our prayers. He needs our devotion. And surely that kind of God who has a need is not all sufficient. So he's addressing the fact that they're not actually serving and worshipping an all-sufficient, self-existent, all-powerful God. So, he didn't need anything since he himself gives to all life and breath to all things. He is the creator, the existor and the sustainer of all things. I mean, Paul has just come into these guys and he has wiped the deck. You've been worshipping all these other gods. Let me just clear the deck and introduce you to the previously unknown God who is the maker of everything that ever has and ever will be. He has set a new standard for these guys in worship of a new God, the true God. The psalmist speaks again of this self-existence in Psalm 90, verse 2, if you wanted to write that one down or go there, before the mountains were born. It's our memory verse. Or you to give birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Present tense. Now that present isn't uh, based on an infinite sense. You are God as you always have been you always will be God. There's no point in time. This is why the Bible says our faith cannot be confounded because it is God who justifies the elect. Do you know it's not your job? And I'll get onto this next week when we talk about the self-sufficiency of God or when we get to it. This might only be a two-part series by the time we start this morning. But you don't have to defend God. God is able to defend himself. All right? Your job is to defend the gospel, the message. 
You should defend the person of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the work and the person of Jesus Christ. But you don't have to defend God. I mean, Paul went to the Lord about this and really was encouraged that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God's able to take care of himself. He's big enough (laughs) to take care of himself. And so we don't need to do that. Well, Spurgeon commenting on this particular passage of Psalm 90, verse 2, which is our memory verse this week, said, Before the mountains were brought forth, the Lord was glorious and self-sufficient. He simply was when nothing else was. He was God when the earth was not a world, but a chaos. When mountains were not upheaved, the generation of the heavens and the earth had not even commenced. Well, this morning as we close, I want to have a look at a couple of definitions that some great theologians have put up to help us with what God's self-existence looks like. Let's have a look at J.I. Packer. All right, can you see that there? What are we going to look at one this morning? God does not have it in him to go out of existence, just as we do not have it in us to live forever. Okay, so God can't go out of existence. We don't have it in ourselves to live forever in that sense. He's doing a comparison. We necessarily age and die because it is our present nature to do that. God necessarily continues forever Unchanged. Why? Because it is his eternal nature to do that. This is one of the many contrasts between creature and creator. God's self-existence is basic truth. It is the basis of all logic. It is self-revealing logic. Next week we'll talk about cause and effect. All effects have a cause. So we're going to track back that initial cause. Who is that initial cause? Well, scientists have no initial cause. Where is your initial cause? Where did the universe, where did the stars, where did the created order come from? It did not come from chaos. We know that. Nothing chaotic naturally evolves into order. We know that. It's the third law of, uh, what is the second or third law of thermodynamics. Ryrie, the theologian, says if God exists endlessly, then he never came into existence, nor was he ever caused to come into existence. But God's eternal, that's what we mean by that. He never came into existence, nor was he ever caused to come into existence. Or else that would imply what? There was a cause that caused God. He is endlessly self Existent. Now here's the hardest one. I'm going to finish on this one. So stay with me. I'm going okay. Fantastic. To say that God is uncreated, Thomas Oden. To say that God is uncreated or self-existent or self-subsistent. So he's literally using just three words there for self-existent means simply that God is without origin. We've talked about origins this morning. God just simply doesn't have an origin. That God is the only ground of God's being. So God is grounded in himself. And that there is no cause prior to God. This insight arises necessarily out of the awareness that if anything affects... Let me read this again because it's the way words are a bit tricky. This insight arises necessarily out of the awareness that if any effects exist at all, then there must be causes. And consequently, some reality must ultimately be uncaused or have the cause in itself. Such a thing must exist then in itself. So he's saying if there is a cause, that original cause must exist within itself. It must be self-existent requiring no antecedent cause or prior cause. This supreme being has not at some point in time become a supreme being, but simply is and has never been otherwise. This underived being whose nature is to be, the Hebrews call Yahweh. I am who I am. 
And the Teutonic languages, that's the early Indo-Europeans, and as we progress through in the modern ages, have called God. It's an insufficient word for the God whom we're talking about here. It is an inferior, completely inferior word. Because we're describing somebody with three letters that a God simply cannot be described. So next week I want to talk about what our response should be to God's self-existence. How it plays with our heart and our mind, yet we should be responsive to it in a way that will inspire and stir our faith. So on that note, what I want us to do is we're going to close up right now.